Okay, good evening, everybody, on a Thursday. Um, we are going to do sort of a cleanup, a look at the final piece of the ubiquitous classroom, the Google Classroom. And then we're going to do uh, the module four. Uh, tonight's class is actually being is actually taking place because the 679 class that I normally would be meeting with on these uh, Thursdays, the uh, person that we had set up for the uh, presentation, et cetera, basically bowed out on Monday of this week. <laughs> and I just couldn't get somebody to, to uh, take their place. So we gave everybody the night off and gave them the credit, et cetera, et cetera. So here we are. So let us go back and look at where we are. Uh, I have received many uh, requests that uh, I join the Google Classroom that you all have created. I thank you for that. I think uh, what we saw last week with our good friend, Kerry Gupton, was that He, uh, Carrie did, Carrie, listen to me, he, she did an excellent, excellent job of teaching Google Classroom to us. I think the thing I hope that a lot of you realized, um, and uh, Carrie kept referring to this, is how deep the thing can get. I also think she did a really good job of helping us realize that the classroom is sort of the final resting place the drive, the Google Drive, is where everything is created, stored, organized. And as she and I were kibitzing about last week, the uh, or the week before, excuse me, that we are of the, I have to have folders, I have structure, I have to have organization before I can do anything. I When I go in and visit with people who have Google Classrooms and I look at their structure and I see all these things scattered everywhere within the drive, I guess... You know, I guess, but um, I'm the kind of person, if you saw my desktop back in my office, you'd go, oh, look, he has lots and lots of folders. Um, I can't stand clutter on computer desktops. It drives me nuts. Now, I think the thing holds for the Google Classroom that I think we really should think in terms of looking at the drive, because all these are linked, as you're going to see here in just a second, uh, when we go in and look at sites, they're all linked. Uh, and that's the beauty of them, is everything just seamless back and forth in how it works. What are we doing tonight? Well, we're going to look at first something called Google Sites, and here it is. So why are we looking at Google Sites? As, and essentially, it's a website. Let's not kid ourselves. So why am I, what am I looking at this, Steve? I've got, I've got a Google Classroom. What do I need this for? One of the things that... Uh, we need to realize is that the Google Classroom is limited in the way that it can present to kids, uh, especially in a visual way. And I think that uh, one of the arguments that we can make when we, when we talk about digital natives here in a minute, when we look at that module, is that we have a very visual uh, student these days. They're, they have grown up on everything being presented to them in a visual format. I, on the other hand, grew up with everything being presented to me in a book, in a written format. Although I can tell you I spent many, many, many an afternoon on my good friend Louis Kaufman's back porch reading comic books because we loved the pictures that went with all the words. So having a, a Google site allows us to have the expansion of our Google Classroom to where we can put in things that um, expand on what we're doing. Now, some people would say, but Steve, that's why you have the materials. That's why you have the links within assignments. I'm not arguing that. But I still do think that there are things there that um, you'll see when we get into it. Now, I'm not the end all be all of Google Sites. I mean, I know how it works and I can use it, but I'm not saying that this is the, the last word. You have to look at it and decide whether or not what you think 
um, you would use it for or in your class would make sense to have it as an outside uh, location. One of the things, and when I used to teach this course and we were using something called a wiki, one of the things we liked about wikis was that the wiki could stand outside of the classroom and be sort of like a bulletin board for parents to see what was going on inside the classroom. But you didn't have to worry about the parents, you know, getting into your stuff. Same thing here with the Google Sites. I can have a place where parents can see the kinds of things like here are the assignments we're doing. Here's the support material that we're using. Because all of this is basically cut and paste, uh, copy and paste. It's pretty straightforward and simple. And so you can see here that it's a uh, website. Um, as you can see, we have pictures, we have announcements, infographics, links, embed. The embed is one of the things that the embed code, and we're going to take a look at that because I got a couple of things to show you. Um, next week, when we come back together, we're going to be looking at the um, amazing, amazing resources that are sitting out there uh, that are free for you to use. But a lot of them are based upon using embeddable code. And embeddable code is where you can copy something that brings the whole thing to your page. You don't leave the page. You just can actually see it. Uh, the FET people have done really nice work with this. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you um, a cute little uh, site tonight that allows you to create embeddable documents of anything on the web. I'm going to go shut the door because they're being too loud. That's different. Usually people are standing at our door going, you're too loud. All right. So as you can see down here, we create a site's web page with link to your classroom and contents for students to discover. Okay. I left that deliberately vague like that because I wanted you to play with it uh, as much as you wanted to. I don't, um, you know, it, am I looking for certain things? Sure. I'm looking for the link to your classroom. And I'm looking for content for the students to discover. Well, that could be one thing, it could be two things. And, you know, again, you can argue with me, well, why would I put, and you'll see in a minute how easy it is, why would I put a YouTube video on my Google Sites versus my Google Classroom when, since Google owns YouTube, it can basically just show up in an assignments. We'll take a look at those two ideas and talk about them. And then I says, I said, Let's get in here. Uh, I'll show you a cute little, uh, when I say cute, I mean a uh, cool little uh, tool that lets you make a embeddable code out of anything. Oh, I also wanted to mention this. We'll come back to these, these 50 awesome applications that integrate with Google Classroom. Um, again, what I wanted just to let you see here, uh, last, and we will talk about this next week, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the KET uh, online uh, resources for classrooms. There are a plethora of them. My good friend Larry Moore was just here yesterday at the university. And one of the exciting things about what they're doing now with the um, KET stuff is you have the ability to link it straight into your Google Classroom. So we'll come back to this whole section on all of these wonderful um, applications and we will look at that. I'll put in the new stuff that's from Larry. So I'm going to scroll past all that and here we are. Now, um, what I put up here, I've stolen, gave her all the credit, from Alice Keeler, Teacher Tech. She does a really nice website. I actually know Alice. Uh, I would call Alice the uh, latest Kathy Chirac, for those of you who have been around for a little while. Uh, Kathy Chirac is a, a person who basically sort of started this whole business of putting stuff on the web for teachers' use. Um, Alice, uh, what I like about Alice is, is she does a really nice job of putting out content that is easy 
uh, for anybody to follow with really good, strong graphics where things go, yada, yada, yada. And as you can see, that's what she's doing here. She's giving you uh, a real quick, down and dirty way to connect up uh, stuff that's on your Google Classroom to a Google Sites. And then basically you can create a Google a page on your Google Sites and you can then make that uh, available through your classroom. That's what we're going to do tonight. And here's some um, videos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we're going to dive in in just a second, but I just want to show this to you. This is really kind of cool. So create an embed code from any URL. So when I click on this, very straightforward, very simple. It brings me here. Sorry, Carrie, I accidentally uh, closed out the session. We are now back. Let me make sure that I turn it back on. Oh, it was kept right on recording. Thank you very much. Collaborate Ultra. It's almost daytime. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be worth doing. All right. So we're sitting here chatting about, let's go find uh, a website that we might want to turn into an embeddable code. And I'll show you what I mean when I say that. So we're going to go to nasa.gov. It's full of cool stuff. And here we are. So as you can see, there's all kinds of stuff here at the NASA site. Now, I could just grab this one URL, the NASA.gov one, or maybe what I want to do is I want to send kids into the galleries because there might be something there that they would like to use. Um, with their kids. So if we go in and look at imagery, um, don't let me lose that mission thing there. If we go in and look at imagery, see this changes up here. Now what I'm trying to show you is let's go ahead and do it. So I'm going to grab just that URL, which would take me into the galleries of all the incredible imageries that images that uh, NASA has. Then I go to this little embed code generator and I'm going to paste in the code or the, uh, the URL. As you can see, there's the preview. That's what it's going to look like. Now, what's nice about this is here's the code. And so what I do is I can basically, and I can change how it looks on my page. So I can go dark theme, which everybody seems to be into these days. Um, I can do social buttons if I want to have that, or I can turn it off, which I just did. Uh, let's see, SEO in bed. I'm not sure what that does. I think what that does is it um, search engine optimization. In other words, it floats it up to the top if people were looking for stuff on your page. Let's just leave ours looking like this. Now, notice under sizing, I can change the size, but I find it's pretty, you know, smart <laughs> to leave it alone and let it autofill. Especially knowing that, you know, people look at your pages through a lot of different uh, uh, devices. Okay, so all I did just to review, is I went somewhere and found a web page. Um, and let's see, I'm, I, I'm going in here looking at all this. So he, here's the live. Is this a live feed from NASA TV, Mark? What is this? Okay. So, you know, here we've got some stuff that maybe we might want to put on our page so kids could see what, you know, is happening at NASA. 
So here I have, I put it in. This is for the images, by the way. I'm going to do a control copy to get all of this code. Now notice that I had to click into it to get it highlighted. It doesn't do it automatically. A lot of these sites will tell you right below that there is a copy link and you just copy and go. This one doesn't. You got to make sure you copy it. So I'm going to copy it. Now, hang on to that thought for a second while I get us out and we go play in a Google Sites. Well, we're just not having a good night tonight. All right, that's enough. We're not going to have any more craziness going on. So how do you get to Google site? Well, you could probably have already guessed it. You go to sites.google.com. If you already have been working on a Google Sites, just like everything within the Google verse, it comes up. Especially if you're in your Chrome browser and you have logged in to your Chrome browser. By the way, and all that lives right over here. See my fat little face over here? So see, I've, I've logged in to my Chrome browser using a Gmail account. Um, the Waffles, we talked a little bit about this, I think, one time. The waffles is where everything lives that is googly um, you can move these around put them where you want them to go and that's why when you come into things like this and you see things like drive is sitting here that's why all this stuff knows what it is it knows where these things are and as you can see i've been playing around in here and i have been creating so let's start from the very beginning don't lose that thought about that embed code thing. So here I go. I'm going to, you know, the classic button. I'm going to press it. And it's going to give me a format to now put my page together. So I'm going to call my untitled site Swan in Space. Okay. And it could be anything you want. Up here is where it automatically drops it in. And then here's your page title. So think about sites as a, if you've never done web design, this is so beautifully simple. It's, it's very addicting, frankly. But the, the beauty of it is everything is just so simple to work with. So like in just about everything, um, let's explore space in this class, okay? And make sure you spell things right, Steve. And so what we, it's my e key. <laughs> it's not me, it's my e key. The thing that, uh, there, thank you. The thing that uh, makes this so interesting is, of course, can I change this? Yep. Can I stretch it out? Yep. Okay. Can I move it around on the page? Yep. You know, you have all of these abilities in your design process. Um, and right now it looks like I should probably look at maybe changing the size of it. So let's go down to a heading instead of a title. Bam. Now I got something a little bit easier to work with. And I'm sorry for that. That's my uh, Grammarly keeps popping in, trying to take over. Let's look real quick around the screen. This is where we put in our title. It automatically drops it in. Here's the title for this page that I want to work with. And as you can see, I can drag it around on the screen and put it different places. I can change an image. If I want to select an image or upload an image, if I want to give it a, a backdrop that maybe looks more spacey, and there it is. Okay. There we go. So just that fast, I've already have got something that looks like something. 
Now, when you come over here, you'll notice that you have these three tabs across the far right. And by the way, these, this up here is for navigation purposes, which, you know, um, we, will we will look at here in just a second. But let's look at this. So here we have the insert. So what does this do? This allows us to add things in to our page that we are creating here. Here are the pages. And right now, the only page that we have is a home page. So if I want to create more than just this one home page, there it is right there. It's as simple as that. I can create it with a new page or new link. So in other words, if I want to pull something in from my Google Classroom, get that link, throw it in. I'll show you that in just a second. And then finally over here, this is where you can change the whole look of your website. So if you want to do something different, um, you can. Now you can change your font style, you can change the look. But notice when I do that, I'm not so happy with that. You know, I kind of like that sort of clean look. One of the things when I used to teach people how to code in HTML was the more white is better. In other words, putting lots of background stuff in um, just distracts. And when you want to use things like this image that I've got sitting here, you're doing it because you're trying to get kids to focus in on what you're doing. Now, so that's themes. As you can see, kind of like in, in the Google Classroom, there's not a lot of themes here. Um, can I play with that? Sure. And you play with that here. In other words, you can change the, the image so you can put stuff in that makes it look more what you want to do. But let me warn you, putting images in is something that should be, do, should be done very deliberately. In other words, I'm putting in a picture of this because that's what we are studying. It shouldn't just be willy-nilly, here's a cute dog picture. It should be something that helps me as a student understand what this page is about. Now, let's get to that insert. Here's where the, here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's where the interesting stuff is. As you can see, let me go check back here. Yeah, we're good. As you can see, I've got all kinds of things here. I've got a text box. So that would allow me to put something in here that would be a text box. And there it is. Here is a library of images from NASA. Okay. So I can put that in here. And when I do, as you can see, it's its own thing. Okay. Over here, you can change the color of the background, you get rid of it, um, and you can duplicate it if you want to. Will it move around? Yes, it'll move around on the page. You can change how it looks. You can edit it. You can do anything you want to it. But then, let's look what happens when I do this one. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to do an embed. Now, I'm not doing it by Earl which is one way to do it. I'm doing it by the actual code. <laughs> Please, Grammarly, go away. Okay, so I'm going to now paste that code in that we got from that little website that we were playing with. So I'm gonna do a Control V, there it is, and then I'm gonna do a Next. Well, now that's weird. Let's reload the browser and see. This must be my, my day. I had some problems with something else. Let's go back to here. Let's grab that. Let's grab that. Let's put it into the code generator. Well, see, there it is. There's our code. Uh, make sure I got it all. I tell you what, let's do a control A for grabbing everything. Let's do a control C to copy it. And let's come back here and try that again. So we're going to do an embed. We're going to do it with the code. And we're going to paste it all in. And we're going to go next. And it still did it. 
Hmm. All right, let's go up a level with our NASA thing. And maybe we just need to do NASA.gov. Let's see if that works. So I'm going to go to NASA.gov. I'm going to do a control C, a copy. Come back to my friends here. I really, I mean, here it all is. You know what? Let's see if that might change things a little bit. Let me try it one more time, gang. I changed the SEO, I turned it on. And let's do a control A, a control C. Let's jump back into our page. Let's do our embed, change it to code, and paste it in, do it next. Still did it. Do one more reload. All right, so this time, let's go and just get the the site itself, drop it in here, wipe that out, and let's just put in NASA.gov, bam. And then here's your embed code again. Let's do a control A, a control C, go back to my page, do my embed, embed code, You know what I think it is, Mark? Are you having any luck? I'm doing it right now. I'm okay. To see, this. see this little G that keeps showing up down here in the bottom of that when it pops up? That's my Grammarly trying to be helpful. And I'm, I'm going to turn it off. Yes, disable forever. Thank you. All right, let's see what happens now. So I'm going to paste that code back in, and I'm going to do it next, and bam. That's what it was. So it was just the silly Grammarly that was running on my uh, Chrome. Let's go back and dig a little bit deeper into that and see if we can do what I was talking about. So let's do NASA TV. And copy that. Bring it into our embed code generator. And paste it in. And there it went. Okay. Uh, down here, control A, control C. And let's go back over here. And let's give myself another embed. And do the embed code here. Drop it in and do a next, and there it is. So as you can see, what's happening here is I have, because of the embeddable code that I've been able to put in here, I've been able to have that available for my kids that they can click on it. Now, let me show you how you check for that. So we're just playing around right now. But if I want to see what it looks like, I come up here to publish. And you can see it gives me all this stuff. And as you can see, and this is something I would really urge you to think about doing. See down here where it says search settings? Request public search engines to not display my site. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go push. And now when I've done that, I go back up to the publish, go down to the little drop down thing, and I can say, view the published site. And here we are. And so what I get now doing this is I get the ability to send kids to areas that I want them to go to. They don't have to go hunting around. Here we go. Here's the NASA site. And I keep everything focused from my web page instead of let's all go to NASA and wander around and wonder what we're looking for. Now, the same thing can be done with, I'm going to go ahead and close these. The same thing can be done with YouTube videos, and it works even better. Let me show you what I mean. So let's go back out here 
to our friend and go to YouTube real fast. Uh, let's see. Let's do just a NASA search. Okay. Ooh, the, this is really cool. I was looking at this just today, yesterday. So when you're here, what you can do is you can do a right click, copy embed code. And then when you come back over here to your site and you hit that embed button again, you can either do it by URL or embed code. Now, there is a hot debate that goes on out there. So let's do it both ways and I'll show you. So if I do it by putting in the embed code, I'll go ahead and just copy that in. I'll go next, next, insert. There we are. Now, what's nice is once I open this up, you'll see that it comes out nice and clear. Let's go back and do it with um, the video by just grabbing its URL. So in other words, I can either right click, copy video URL, come up here and copy it in the uh, address bar, whichever way. And I'm gonna copy the video URL, bam. And then I'm gonna come back to my page. I'm gonna do another embed, but this time I'm gonna do it by URL. And I'll insert. Now, let's go look at the publish side and you'll see what I'm talking about. So if I now go uh, um, publish settings, you always have to publish it before you go look at it, okay? It's not like you've published it and then it's there. You have to keep publishing. Then I'm gonna go publish, view the published site. Okay, there's our URL for our website. There's the other one. And as you can see, they're both here. But notice, when I do it with the embed code, and I try to play it, it's kind of trunked. Okay? The stuff that's in here kind of gets sort of scrunched. Now that's the embed code. If I do it with the URL, now I've got it clean. In other words, it's come in basically the same way it looks. Notice you you've got the same buttons here, so you can you know blow it up and watch it full screen if you want to. Okay. Very straightforward um, use of two tools. Number one is if you're in YouTube, it's basically doing a right click, copy the URL, come into your site, then do the embed, paste it in the um, URL location, and bam, you've got it. But again, well, Steve, you can do this in Classroom. Yes, you can. But here I can build a much more um, engaging, I guess might be the right word, site that me put stuff in that I want to use. Images is exactly what you think it is. You can go find images and put them in. One of the things that it doesn't do a very good job with, and by the way, notice that you're using the ability to um, use the images without worry. So I'm going to basically do a search for NASA. Got some cool pictures here. Okay. And I'm going to select it. And now I've got it in my page as well. Move it around on the page, put text next to it. I can come in here and do a text box. Keyboard is gone. <laughs> it does not like my e key. Look at that. <laughs> Thank you. I'll go ahead and put that in. Okay. So now I've got a text box that goes here with my wonderful little picture that I have created. Okay. What else can I do? Well, hello. So now, so from my drive, now I've got the whole world at my fingertips of my stuff. Okay. 
And the power of this is, this goes back to now design. I can look at other things and put it in on this page, or I can realize that probably what I need to do now is to make a new page. And I'll go pages and I'll give it a name. And now I have a new page. What do you notice about the things on this page? It hung on to my background. Uh, it hung on to my name. And you notice the Goog does its, I call this a table of contents, index, you know, whatever you want to call it. Its true technical term is index, but it puts it across the top. So easy enough for me to have the ability to jump back and forth between pages. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. Now, if I want to, I can go in back to my insert, back to my Google Drive. And let's see what happens if I throw something into the Google Drive. We've already played enough with the, um, the video. Let's see if I can find something. It's not going to give away too much of stuff. Here's a, a Google form that basically kids can use to sign up for training, which is kind of cool. So let me do that. Let's throw that in just for, for giggles. So here is a Google form. And I'm going to insert it. There we go. That came right out of my Google Drive again. Publish, because it's new. You know, I always say, when in doubt, publish. And then view the published site. So here we are. Let's go look at our space travel. And there's my form, which is live, by the way. So if you filled this out, it will feed back into a spreadsheet. And as you can see, this is where the uh, kids have already used the form and filled in information. Very simple. Should we do a forms class or a forms review? I think we should, don't you? Maybe next week when we start looking at all these disparate things that are floating around out there that we can use. Yeah, okay, we'll do a forms. I love forms. To me, the beauty of forms is um, it's, it's a flat database. Most databases that are in use today on the web, frankly, in everything, are what are called relational databases, which means they're like these little, little mini databases, although some of them can be very, very large. But these mini databases that are all linked together into a front page um, using what's called a key file. And then you basically can zoom in and out, up and down, all around, do comparisons, do that kind of thing. Well, that's cool. You know, that's wonderful. But the, the beauty of a flat database is it just gets things done. And it's very simple to set up. And again, the beauty, I can remember teaching classes on FileMaker Pro. And the highest point of understanding a FileMaker Pro was to take a FileMaker Pro relational database and put it onto the web. My goodness, you would not believe the code you had to go in and manipulate and change and point it to here, point it to there, point it to your index page, all that. When you do that on a forms, there's a link up there that says, uh, make this available on the web, boof, and stuff. So that would be a place, when we look at forms, that'd be a place where we could stick it on this page and we could use it as a way for like parents to say, I'd like to have, uh, you know, meet you on parent night, da, da, da. Okay, let me get back to my page. All right. So here we are. By the way, I can share this with others. Now let's go up here and do this little trick. 
first one is this is where everything where you can look at it um get your site analytics in other words how many people have come in to visit it the Goog is famous for this you know if you have a YouTube channel you can go in and see how many times people have actually come in and not only can you see how many times people actually come in um, it'll be unique meaning that if Mark came into my site one time he gets counted as a visit so in other words Mark could come in and visit 50 times and that could be misconstrued to say, well, you have over 50 people. Nope, I just have one guy who keeps coming to my website. But if you do uniques, that means that it basically says, Mark was on this machine with this IP address, and therefore he is a unique. Now, if he comes in on his phone, if he came in on a tablet, uh, or he came on another computer, it'll register him as a unique. So. But the point is, uh, you've got all this analytics that gives you an idea who all is out there and look at. Now, let's go look at this. Okay, so here I'm basically saying how I'm going to share this. And as you can see, I can publish it. Anyone can find and view. Uh, that's all I want. Thank you very much. So I'm going to change that. I'm going to turn that off, which by the default it is. Okay. And I can invite people down here. And I can do that with just putting their names in, um, so on and so on. Simple, simple, simple. Just like you did with your page, with your uh, classroom. Same thing. Same idea. Okay. So let me get off of here. And I just cancel it. So that is what that's all about. In other words, you can invite people to see it. Of course, can you just send it home? Sure. Copy publish site link. I have that. And I have a copied link to it. What could I do with it now? You know the answer to that. Get into my classroom. I can put it in there. So let's see. Let me get to classroom. Okay. So how would we put this in? Let's go to classwork or we put it into the stream. Hmm. Maybe I would want to put it in the stream because what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this link will take you to our website. Now, Let's use the right words. It'll take us to our sites home page. Fit in and bang. Post. There we are. And there's my links up here to my different pages that I have created. Here is my uh, kind of just threw stuff at it page. And over here under space travel, what I was trying to show here was the fact that you could have a forms sheet that's that works over here. So in other words, if I were to uh, turn this on so that people could see it, then the, the form side would show up with the little boxes that you would put things in. But I'll show you how to do that next week. So that's really, that's really cool. And it's really easy. All right, let me go back and let's look at what we've got here. I'm sure.
when we look at Google Sites, we look at it not in competition with our classroom, but rather as a way to expand the classroom to include material that we might want kids to see where they can get to it very easily. We have the ability um, and is you, uh, we'll go back to that one. Let me look at that real fast. Okay, so we can have it as a way to outside a, outline a lesson, put resources in there, and then I can have it come back to an assignment, and that's with the uh, Google link here. Okay, it's just that simple. Now, let's go back and look at that. So if I want to come back to here and go to my class, okay? Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. Space is scary assignment, okay? I'm going to copy the link. And if I want to then put that over into my class, I can go up here and I can do an insert and I can put it in as a link right here. Nope, excuse me. That's my link for to go somewhere else. Pardon me. It's right down here. Um, notice all the things that you can do, by the way, with uh, YouTube and um, slides, docs. Everything can just come flying in. Very simple to do. I come down here. I'm going to add a text box. And I'm now going to paste that link in. That simple. Of course, I'd put some text in there that says, uh, go here to see what this is all about. Why are we using it? Publish again. You publish site. And this will take me back to where that lesson was, that assignment was. went here, grabbed the link, went back over to here. Well, not here. I have to get back to where I can work. Let me show you what, how that works because uh, I'm just kind of flipping around here and you're not, you, you notice when I'm here, this is the site, how the world sees it, but also notice down here, you've still got a back door. It's the pencil, the edit pencil. If you click that, it throws you back into where you were working. It's not like you are kind of thrown out there. Um, so here, I'm going to go embed, paste it in, insert it, and now I've got it. And if I publish that, view it. There it is. Where's my space? It's scary. So I can go back and forth. Now, when I say I can go back and forth, what I'm trying to get you to realize is you need to think as you're designing, why would I go back and forth, Steve? Well, here would be my rationale. And this goes back to way back to the beginning of our class when we were talking about things like TPAC and uh, Tim and my favorite, UDL. I think one of the most important things we can do is to give kids ability to see information um, that makes immediate sense to them. You know, I don't think, I don't think my good friend would argue too much with me about one of the things about the Google Classroom is it's really hard to kind of get a sense of what's going on uh, because all of the icons are pretty much the same and you can't change those icons. 
But if I put things in there that gives me a sense of somewhere I can go, like right here, that when I land here, I got a way back, which by the way, I should have done with the actual Google Classroom link. But as you can see, it throws me back and forth very, very simply. It's not hard, not hard. And I click here and now I'm back to where I was. What am I missing, Mark? Am I missing anything? So I'm playing around with the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so let me just show you again. Um, Alice's excellent directions here give you a sense of how to do it. Do not worry right now. Do not worry right now about putting stuff into the sites except playing around with it. Uh, I'm not expecting a polished website here, folks. All I want you to do is to see how you can link back and forth. And one of the things that I kind of dwelled on, maybe a little bit ad nauseum, is this complete an, or create an embed code from any URL. And I think that, that was pretty cool. I think that's an interesting um, little tool to have in your back pocket because it allows you to kind of burrow down into websites and find that place where you want to send kids that then when you put it into your Google sites, it actually uh, puts it in with something like this that tells me what's going on um, or something like that, that basically opens it up and sends me. Now notice also the nice thing about it too is that it opens it outside. So if I wanna go back to the Google sites, I just close the window and I'm right back to the page where it came from. The video side though, the nice thing about videos, when you put them in your sites page like this, is it doesn't go outside. It keeps you right here located on the video page. So again, people don't go wandering. All right, I'm going to Start closing some, let's go see if our friend is in the room. Hey, young lady, have you got anything to add? Not really. The, the sites at all? I'm not a fan of sites, so. Hold on a sec, I gotta turn you up. It's, it's not you, it's me. I've played with the lights, but it's not really something that I use <laughs> just because I'd rather just put it all in Google Classroom. All right, somewhere I've got a page playing a video. <laughs> so now, um, I tell you what, hold your judgment, Carrie, until next week. Uh, when we dive back into things like FET and all these other cool, um, you know about FET, don't you, P-H-E-T? Oh, yes. Okay. So let's have a conversation around a site like that and how we could, and I'm not, as I said, this is not the, the final answer here. I'm playing around with sites, looking at it and thinking, okay, is this a way that I can expand my classroom without it? wandering off, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Maybe we'll if you were only teaching like one section, you know, where you, maybe if you were focused on just one section, if you only had one prep, you yep. know, it would make sense. But having multiple preps and it, it's just, yeah, I like I having my one stop shop Google Classroom. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Because if you had the multiple preps, let's call it period one, two, three, four, okay? So would period one link to the site, site, period two, period three, period four, and what would be the purpose of that? I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, like right. I definitely see the good side of sites, especially when you're dealing with like elementary kids. Um, yeah. I. I could see that, but as far as my high school classroom where I have five different classes throughout the day, it's just, I, I would rather just stick with my Google Classroom. 
All right. Let us You okay, Mark, if I move on to four? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let us move on to module four. I tell you, I had been teaching all day um, what are called 201 classes here at the university. These are people who, are, who have expressed an interest in becoming teachers, but they really haven't had any real class to train them about what it is like to be a teacher. They're a very interesting group because they really do represent what this module is all about. Uh, and of course, the people that Carrie deals with and the people you deal with, Mark, are also very much a part of this whole discussion. And the discussion is, is the digital native real? Do we really think that digital natives approach learning differently uh, than what we would consider the normal way that we have all learned. And then, of course, the other problems you hear people make a great deal of writing about is the disconnect from digital natives to digital immigrants. Now, let me give you some examples. So today, I was working with a group of 201 students, these would probably be sophomores here at the university, who are in a classroom where we are talking about that they have to develop a presentation on the ideas around what does it take to be an effective teacher in the 21st century. Now, as I say to them, I'm going to show you a tool that will allow you to create an online presentation that is complete with images, text, and music. Music being the key word here. And so we look at something called Animoto. I don't need to go into detail on it with you, just trust me. Um, the thing I found so interesting was, and I said this to him, I said, if I can't show you how to use a tool like this in the first 10 to 15 minutes, it's not worth us messing with it. And I said to them, as an experiment, what I'd like to do is, as I'm going through the tool use up here, you know, step here, click here, go there, do this, you're going to raise your hand when you get it. And we're going to time it, see how long it takes. I said, now, at the end, what we'll do is we'll come around and let's do a, a quick, you know, simple survey. One, this is stupidly simple, shut up, let me get to work. Or five, oh my God, I don't understand what we're doing. So you can probably guess, in five minutes, 85, 90% of the class had their hands up because they got it. It's, it's just that simple. Um, and then I said to them, okay, so what do you see as going to be the important part of this? And their response was finding the right music. So they missed the entire prompt and rubric and the scaffolding. So I had to go back to that and say, okay, so let's look at this. So what we're asking you to do is to go back and look at your notes, look at the stuff that you've learned in this class over this semester, and put it together in a presentation that shows your new understanding about what an effective teacher in the 21st century is about in terms of their role, in terms of the curriculum, in terms of the pedagogy, in terms of diversity. That's jump. So at that point, then, I said, how would you go about doing this? Uh, Google? <laughs> well, yes, but wouldn't you want to go back to first source, primary source material? You know, let's go back and look at what maybe Gardner had to say or anybody, you know, Madeline Hutter, Vygotsky, any of those people that we talk, you know, ad nauseum about. Maybe look at that. Then maybe look at finding them on the web, pictures, and then thinking about how you could then take text. And the really, I think the, the cool thing about Animoto is it doesn't allow you to do a lot of text. It's very Twitter-like. So you really have to condense down what you want to say. Now, some people just thrive in that environment because they're like, sure, got it. 
I'm going to find a picture about showing what um, Vygotsky wrote about proximity and all that sort of good stuff. Because, you know, it's when you first read that stuff, you're like, what? And then it suddenly downs on you. What he's talking about is you go stand next to kids who need help understanding. And then you put that together with a picture, boom, you've got a really nice uh, presentation. So they are having trouble with understanding primary source and then pictures. And then finally, the music. They want to start with music and work backwards. Who, what I'm trying to get to here was when I do this, when I have been teaching this, I'm in the classroom. I'm co-teaching with other instructors here at the U of L who are my age. Yep, you know, a little bit younger. I'm an old guy. But what I'm saying is when they first hear it, they have a hard time getting their head around it. The the program. <laughs> program, not the assignment. To them, the assignment is crystal clear. And, you know, in some cases, the assignment originally started out with write a paper 24 pages long, put, you know, APA style and all that. And they wanted to give this a whirl because they wanted to see. So here's where I think we have some disconnects. Let's go in here. Um, Y'all ever heard of the mindset list from Bullock College? You haven't heard of that? Let me show it to you. So this is a project that Bullock, Bullock College is your classic small liberal arts college in Beloit, Wisconsin. And it has, I don't know how long, it's been a few years, but they basically have created a list of what they see is the understandings of today that kids have today versus what the adults Thank you for joining us. Uh, would have as an understanding. So in other words, would kids today have an understanding of anything older than their age? Kind of the thing. And it's a fascinating study. And I mean, people use it when they're doing research on um, kids. Let's see if I can go to the actual. Yeah. All right, so they've moved it. This is Tom McBride, he's the guy who created it. So it's an online compilation of what has always and never been true for new college students. Um, and it's, it's just cool. Let me just keep going here and let's see if we can get to it. The next one will be in 2019. Can I just go back and see it from another time? Somebody has created, this used to be just very straightforward. All right, let me go back a page and let's see if there's another link that'll let me see it. We've even got books out about it now. It's just amazing. This, this was one of those things that just took off as a way for these guys to talk about the difference that they were having when their 21st century students would walk in the door and what they then thought would be what the kids would have in their heads. And I, I'm sorry for struggling here, you guys, but they've, they've pulled it around. Oh, here they are. There's the list. All right, how far back do you want to go, boss? You want to do the 18 one? Sure. All right, let's look at the 18 one. There's when it first started, 1998. 
For students entering college this fall in the class of uh, 2018, during their initial weeks of kindergarten, they were upset by endlessly repeated images of planes blasting into the World Trade Centers. Since they binge watch their favorite TV shows, they might like to binge watch the video portions of their courses too. I don't think so. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think that. Meds have always been an option. Meds have always been an option. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. When they see wire rim glasses, they think Harry Potter, not John Lennon. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that one. Press pound on the phone is now translated as hit hashtag, right? Yeah, I've heard that. Celebrity selfies are far cooler than autographs. <laughs> the Daily Show with Jon Stewart has always been on the only news program that really gets it right. And of course, it doesn't even exist anymore. Hard liquor has always been advertised on television. Ralph Nader has always been running for president. Okay. The water cooler is no longer the workplace social center. It's a place to fill your water bottle. So these are the boy mind list, mindset list. It's, it's really kind of cool. Um, there's some nice little uh, daily quizzes to give over here. Um, I don't know, Carrie, if you could adopt one of these for like the years your kids walked into high school, which would be what, 2015? I teach freshmen, so. Oh, okay. Well, you get what I'm saying. Yes. So they would be, I don't know, do we have a 19 one? I think that's the one. So. That's the one they're working on. It's going to be ready. August. Yeah. Okay. So that would be interesting. Um, I have seen social studies teachers in high school, they've used this with their kids. And basically they've done time travels, right? They've gone back to a time when the kid was born uh, because most kids are, have been born for as long as the mindset list has been around. Interesting. Mark Prinsky. So here's the guy who created it, folks. This is the guy who coined the term digital native. Mark Prinsky is an instructor over at Virginia Tech. He has one of the seminal books about this, and he has um, a whole uh, bunch of books out there about how to change classroom structures, etc. Because you know, his basic premise is that kids are different. Now, I'm not going to run the video because you could run the video. Uh, do I agree with Mark? Some of it I do. Uh, I think his partnering pedagogy, which is the book that he wrote, is really, um, I think it's a good read. I think it's a little too prescriptive and not enough getting into the behind the, you know, behind the curtain kind of things. But it's, you know, but he gets the credit for creating this. Here is a little video about uh, why not use technology that students love to reach them more effectively. Um, I'll come back to this one in just a second. This one has been around for a while, a vision of students today. And um, I can remember, no, 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 no. how long have I been here? 11 years, let's go back 15 years, 15 years. And this was, this was in every presentation, at every board meeting, every um, meeting when they had administrators. I was an administrator. Uh, anytime they, they would bring people together to talk about technology, they would run this video. So you might want to take a look at it, okay? Um, what I find interesting about it is it's very short. It makes some, you see Marshall McLuhan. Hey, remember him? <laughs> there he is again. 1967. You have this, to me, there's so many memes that are going on in this video. You, you have the one, two note piano in the background, you know, to make it seem like we're kind of tiptoeing around this classroom. And then you get the sort of, 
a heavy kind of dome um, that jumps in. And then you read on what's written, scribbled on all the chairs and everything. I'm telling you, this was de rigor back in the day. Everybody had to watch it. This is the articles I'm going to ask you to read. Hey, he's actually has to read something. Yeah, I, this these hold up, okay? These really do hold up. The first one, and they're not long, is uh, very straightforward. Uh, this idea about do we really have new generation of kids and are they really all that different? And I, it, I have been doing a lot of thinking and reading about this of late. Um, yes, they are. They are different. But let me show you the other one and then we'll talk about that for a second. And here's Mark's seminal work. So I put it in here so that you could see um, this is where it all came from. So those are the two things I'd like you to read. Now, let's get back to that. We all have seen the picture of the little baby holding an iPhone or the little baby playing on an iPad. Uh, I happen to be blessed with uh, having a little man that has been coming to our house now for about three or four months, who is just now one year old. Um, he talks like a blue streak, but he hasn't figured out what words mean yet. And when he sits down, when his parents drop him off and he stays, he stays with my wife, who just is in seventh heaven. I'm in seventh heaven, but I'm with him. And the first thing he does, he goes to his toy bag. And what does he pull out of his toy bag? He pulls out a play phone. In other words, a play iPhone. He looks at it and he throws it back in the bag and then he goes for Julie's XR iPhone. Why? Well, first of all, the XR phone is a really bright coral color. Um, it has this uh, very nice rubbery, you know, protection cover on it. And he loves just flipping through the screens. Now, is he doing anything intentional with it? Nope, not at all. When I sit with him, I have a big 12 inch iPad Pro and I open up the apps that are on my iPad Pro that are supposedly, supposedly for preschool kids. And what does he do? Same thing. He flips and scrolls and just here's what I'm getting at. We've had him since, well, since fall semester. So he comes every single day. He spends all day with Julie. Uh, a television is never turned on. Books are everywhere in my house for little kids and older kids. And so he comes in. He now knows where his, his books are. And he goes over to the bookcase and he just starts pulling them off. And he, they're scattered all over the floor. And then he sits down and he starts sorting through them. And he finds the one that he wants. And then he brings it to us. And he goes, duh, which means read. And then we curl up on the couch and we read together. When he sat with my iPad Pro and we started playing with things like color, numbers, you know, lots of music, lots of distraction. Let's use that term again, distraction. What I noticed was when he was with me with a book, because of the book pictures, text, he was a lot more focused and there was a lot more opportunities for discussion about the pictures. Uh, one of his favorite books that he has is there wasn't a woman who swallowed a fly and it's a card book and the cover is this very large uh, woman. And then you see the circles in her tummy that as you flip the book, they go deeper and deeper into the swallowed a fly, swallowed a spider, swallow the bird, so on and so on, all the way up to the horse. And he just sits there and he giggles and he makes noises and he points at things and you say, where was the spider? And who ate the spider? He points to all of this. Now, here's what I've noticed. When he's on his iPad Pro and we're in something where the, the the iPad Pro is saying to him, let's find the red things. His 
person who's sitting there with him, me or my wife, say, let's find the red things with him. He interacts with the iPad. And he loves what it does. You know, you move it around on the screen and he goes, bloop, bloop, makes noise and all that. He gets that. He gets the, you know, immediate feedback. But what he really wants is that human feedback. So when we say this about digital natives, this is where I come down. Kids who are digital natives have had more experience and more affordances with technology. You know what affordance is? Affordance is something that you use or do that causes something else to happen. Easy example is when you're driving in car, how do you make it stop? You use the affordance of the brake. Okay. So kids who become adept in the various affordances that are out there, paper, pencil, crayons, coloring books, technology, they then become comfortable users of it. One of the things when I used to teach special needs kids, parents would come in and they would be so upset because their kids couldn't cut. In other words, they would want to do something creative with their kids, but their kids couldn't cut paper. And of course, they've been told all kinds of stupid things about don't let them have scissors, they'll cut their fingers off. Um, you know, and we would sit down with them and show them something called a Fisker scissors. I don't know if you know what that is. You know what that is, Mark? Fisker scissors? Instead of having to put your fingers through the two circles at the end of the scissors, it's a squeeze. Uh, I actually like Fisker scissors <laughs> uh, because I feel like I have a lot more control. And if you're somebody who has ever done lots of woodwork, um, you will realize that what you're really using is a tool that you use in woodwork. It gives you control. So it's one of those things where we, if, if we're open to adaptations and giving kids ways of getting at things, then their library of affordances grows. Now, here's where it does change, though. We have a whole generation of prosumers out there. So what are prosumers? Prosumers are people who are producing and then consuming. Uh, all it does, now it takes to have a YouTube channel is a phone. You know that, I know that. And I can remember when I first was teaching about YouTube channels, we would spend a good solid classes understanding all the things you had to do to set up a YouTube channel. Uh, because you had to talk about the various um, codexes that you had to use to get your streaming video right. Uh, the various codexes you had to use to get your streaming audio and video to sync up right. You had all these different things that you had to cover. What do you do now? You go into YouTube and you say, I'm starting to show. You're done. You're now broadcasting live. And that hasn't been that long. So that's the other fascinating thing about it. That's only been around for hmm, seven, eight years. Uh, I have a young man who is a former student of mine, teaches band at Crosby Middle School here in Jefferson County. He has a extremely large YouTube channel now where he basically teaches band as well as showcases kids, showcases the band when they have concerts. And he wrote a paper about it for me. And one of the things that he had the aha moment about was now I finally have a way for people who can't come to my concerts can see the concerts. Because what they would do is they would have a bus and the bus would drive around and pick up all the kids. But because of, I don't know, insurance or whatever, they couldn't transport parents on the bus. I don't know what the story was behind all that. And then he came to me and he was like, so how am I going to do this? I have to, you know, I have to conduct the band. I said, find three kids. You want to do a two camera setup? You want to do a three camera setup? What do you want to do? And he looked at me and he said, I want to do a, a, a two camera setup. Could I have one that just sort of roams around inside the band? Sure. And so we then sat down, because YouTube will do this, YouTube will allow you to have a three camera setup that allows you to switch between the different cameras. So now we had a fourth kid whose job it was, was to keep the video interesting. So it wasn't just a one shot look. 
that you could actually see. Because if you think about that, when you do that, um, you really don't see much. You see this sort of group of people sitting there, you know, doing their instruments. But if you had a camera that could go in and out, so you could get close-ups of the kids while they're working, then you've really got something that's really interesting. And then the last thing we, we uh, hurdled through was uh, audio. That was pretty straightforward. Audio is not hard to get right. Here's my point. In every one of those instances, there were children who weren't necessarily experts, but were adept. They weren't afraid to, so what am I going to do? You want me to have this? We did it with iPads, by the way. We didn't do it with iPhones. You want me to have this iPad, and I'm going to go around, and I'm going to film the band while they're having their concert, right? You two guys are basically going to run two stationary iPads. You are basically the producer, the director in the booth, except you're not in the booth, you're actually sitting out there in the gymnasium. And you're gonna be switching back and forth uh, these various um, signals that you're gonna, your feeds you're gonna get in. And then you're gonna be monitoring what that looks like out in the world of YouTube. So if we hit a big latency lag, um, you know, we'll be aware of it. And then of course the last thing YouTube does is when you do that, it records it. I have seen What's going on now with Chromebooks is a real eye opener because what you're seeing with the Chromebooks is kids are finally getting a tool in their hands that teachers are comfortable enough with that it becomes a paper pencil kind of paradigm as opposed to, oh my God, we've got technology. It becomes a, did you bring your paper pencil to school? Which means that you charge your Chromebook before you walked in the door today. And we're, we see that um, when I go to places where there are one-to-ones, I see that as still being a struggle. But I also would argue with you, and I've sat through enough K-tips, that the teacher who sits in the classroom without the technology still struggles with the kid that doesn't bring the materials to class. It's a different form of the same old problem. But what we're seeing is when you have a school where the kids have bought into the use of the technology, where the technology is frankly valued, so it stays, it becomes a tool that stays in the school, then you take away the accident or the stealing, et cetera, et cetera, part of that equation. Then what we see is kids now starting to understand how the Google sharing Google Docs sharing, uh, collaborating, how all that fits into a new paradigm of technology use in the classroom where kids are creating demonstrations of their understandings. And all this cool stuff that we have played with is just another form of that. And when we get together next week, we'll, we'll do a little deep dive into that and look at how simple it is to throw stuff over uh, into the Google Classroom that's out there now. So, read, watch, think, and then let's have some fun. So what we're going to ask you to do is to use a tool that we kind of looked at last week, or week before, excuse me, um, that I have gotten working. And I'm going to do a um, kind of a, If it doesn't work, here's your workaround because we've had some trouble with it. And when I've contacted the people who I'm paying uh, good money for this, they're basically giving me a kind of, well, we don't know what's going on. We're going to look at something called Beyond. And I'm going to come back and look at it one more time. You know, I showed it to you a little bit, but I want you to get what we're doing with it. So I want you to illuminate the similarities and differences between digital native and digital immigrants responding to the prompt. Is the digital native real? And how do we develop a virtual classroom to meet their needs? So if we go into the beyond, and if you want to log in with me, you can. Or if you want your own free trial that will last for 14 days, go forth and do. Here's what I mean. So if I go click on login here, it's waiting for me to put in my email address, and then here's the password. Well, you know what these are. This is sbswan02 at louisville.edu. Password is ULIT241. 
we'll log in. And then it does this. Now, the only people who could possibly be on this thing right now would be Mark, Carrie, and I. But it's still doing this. And it shouldn't. Okay? I have an account that basically gives us multiple people can log in at the same time. So I'm going to go ahead and log in anyway. Now, the other thing that we did find is this is the um, studio version, which is using HTML5. So you do need to have a fairly uh, recent browser, Chrome, you know, Chrome with its latest updates. Firefox, eh, eh, eh. Next, don't get near it. <laughs> and Internet Explorer, run away, run away, run away. Safari, surprisingly, does quite well because, like I said, this is HTML5. Now, the, the only thing that I've noticed is um, you would think things would be a little more snappy than they are. Um, and that's okay because that could be, you know, a network traffic issue here at the university. I don't know. But let me just walk you through how to do this. As you can see, people have been in here playing. And I'm going to go make a video. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select a style. Feel free to pick any of these styles. I'm not trying to put you into a box. Uh, the one on the far right, which is the whiteboard animation, is that cool thing where it looks like somebody's writing on a, on a whiteboard. Kind of neat. Um, and you could do all the things that you normally would do, but you're not going to get the sort of uh, color and animation ability that you can with these other two. See? This is what I don't understand that it's doing. I am a full-blown owner of this thing, and it keeps doing this to me. So this, do me a favor and get in. I did. I think that's what kicked you out. You did? Uh, yeah. Okay. As soon as I logged in. All right. So he kicked me out. He kicked me out. Mark just kicked me out. <laughs> Bad old Mark. All right, so log in anyway. Now it tell just, me if it yeah, kicked. kicked me out. All right, so we've got a problem with them not recognizing that I have a much higher. I have a professional account. Look over here, you can see it. You look under here. Um, there you go. I have an essential account. Maybe they've changed it now. All right, let me go back to this. So if you get that kind of thing happening, just go make the free account. It gives you everything. I'm going to jump in here and do the uh, middle one because it has lots and lots of graphics, lots and lots of different ways that you can do things. And as you can see, it's doing the loading beyond studio down here. This is not Flash. This is HTML5. So once it finishes loading, it's all there waiting for you. It gives you a starting point right here and right here. This is nothing more than the web doing what the web has to do, which is it has to have a placeholder. It can't have, have nothing. The web hates the null set. So as you can see, it already has a scene that has put in for us. We don't want that. We're going to create our own, and I'll show you that in just a second. What you can do, though, if you want to, if you go up here and click on character, you can create your own character. So if you want to have your own person in here, you can create your own look and you can create your own i don't really have that much yeah okay thank you and i can just basically go through this and i can change out what this looks like and i can change the clothing i can change skin color i can change what i might be wearing let's see mark what am i wearing today kind of looks like this sort of a sweater look okay We'll go with that, okay? And I can go back to over here. And I can see what I'm doing. I can go back to my head. I can just, you could just go nuts in terms of what you can do. I can come in here with my pants. <laughs> I don't know why I need to care about my pants. And I can do hats and accessories, okay? So I can basically build a, a pretty good representation of who I am. Make sure you put a name to it. So I'm going to go back and I'm just going to say, sure, fine. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go back to where I was. It 
and we'll save it in there. Okay, now what I need to do first is I need to get a background. So I'm going to either add a template or do a scene. So I'm going to do an add a template because that'll give me a place where I can start looking for what I might want to use. There's education. We'll come back to that. There's finance, government, HR, healthcare. Some of these get really fun. Um, here's uh, insur <laughs> insurance. I don't even want to know. I guess maybe it's, yeah, accidents. Um, leisure, marketing, a lot of schools I've worked with have used this marketing one. News, office, pirate. These are the kind of weird ones are. Pirate, screens, space, good one, space. Uh, sports, another good one. Superheroes, you get the idea. Training, travel. All right, let's just, let's be really boring and let's go back and do education. So in education, what I can do is I'll go ahead and I'll pick this as my scene. And now that I've picked that scene, I can get rid of the one that's sitting there as a placeholder. Boom, just like that, okay? Now, what can I do with this? Oh my goodness, what can't I do with this? So at this point, I can add props into the thing. So if I want to like change up this prop back here, because that's what it is, this blackboard, and I might want to put something up there that looks computery, you know, like a, a, cl a clear touch. If I want to put something like that. Um, let's see if I can find it. You know what, Steve? Why don't you just do a quick search? There we go. Okay. So I could put that screen in there. Well, you can see that if I click on it, it highlights it. And then if I hit the delete key, it goes away. And I can drag this prop in and I can make it bigger and I can have it in here. It's got a cracked screen. You see where I can have a whole story about this and she's talking about the cracked screen and the kid is gonna say to her, you know, if you stand there and keep hitting it with your baton, you're going to break it or something like that. You get the idea? So I have a beginnings here. Um, I can put a text box in. So if I want to give it a label or title, I can even add music. I can go really crazy. Now let's go back to the character side. Let's see if I can find the little kid that I might want to put into this shot. Oh, there it was. Okay, so let's put a kid into the shot. Okay, he's a little too small. Here we go. All right. And maybe that kid might need a prop. Let's see if we got a computer sign. Oh, yeah, so I was looking for it. Thank you. So let's drag a tablet in here. Way too big. We'll shrink that down and have it over here next to the kid. Might want to make the kid a little bit bigger so he and the tablet are, you know, a little more. There we go. Okay, now I've got things kind of set up here. I need to make her a little bit bigger. So she and the boy fit together in the shot. And there she is. Now, what can I do with these characters? Well, let me close this window out. And what I have now is the ability to work within this amazing little creation I've done here. So I can have her talking to the boy. I could have her having an action. And if you look at what some of the actions might be, let's see, let's do an emotion. And we can see that she might be angry. We can preview that by clicking on the preview and it shows you what it would look like. So if I apply that, okay, well, the first thing I got to realize is that I got to move things around a little bit here because she is behind the screen when I really need her to be in front of the screen. So I'll move her here. 
or I'll move the computer, one of the two. And so she's basically having a conversation and I'm going to send that computer screen to the back. There she is. Now she's in front. And as you can see, now I've got her lined up just right. I can click on her again. And now I can go to dialogue, add dialogue, text to speech. If I'd like, I could record my own voice talking, but I can do text to speech. I can have her doing something like, what in the world is going on here? And of course, my E key let me down again. And I can pick a voice. I'll, I'll stick with Joanna. I can generate it. Oh, not here. OK. And when I do that, if you'll notice down below, where I've been working, it pops in with her voice. So what we have here is a setup where our digital immigrant has been working with this very large um, computer screen, monitor screen, and she's broken it with her pencil or her pointer. Our digital native now could come in and basically have a conversation about adults need to understand that technology must be used correctly to have any impact. Okay. Again, we'll stick with that. We'll go to a voice for a man or a male. Oh, look, he could be Indian. He could be Australian. He could be anything you want. I think he looks like a Simon from the United Kingdom, don't you? Here are your Sam. Adults need to understand that technology must be used correctly to have any impact. Okay. So notice that he is in the same space as the first voice. So I need to grab that and slide it over so that when this thing runs, we have separation between the two. I could keep this theme going by adding just another scene. And I could continue the last scene. And I could put in different stuff here, but keep Simon. In other words, Simon can stay here and he could have conversations about the dumb things that adults might do um, with technology. And we would change out uh, our person here, uh, change out you know, all the props, put in different props, put in a different person. Um, do all of that, and I can just keep going with the idea that he's going to have this sort of, you know, come to know how everything works. And at some point, what you would hope maybe he would do is say, this is why I am, I'm capable of all this because I'm not afraid of it, depending upon what you read. That's beyond. You want to make sure that you come up here and you put a title on it, first thing. Then you can come over here and you can preview it. To understand the technology must be used. Okay. And then you can see that it's automatically saving it. And when I hit the snowman, I can either do a download the video or I can do a share. And I got to make sure that I enable it. Make sure that everybody can see it. And now I've copied the link. So now I've got a link that I can put anywhere. And even though you're on the 14 day plan, <laughs> it'll still take you over to it. Uh, if you really, really like it and want to hang on to it. See, you can do a download here and I'm going to put it on my desktop. I'm going to save it. 
I find this is interesting because this is exactly how Collaborate Ultra does theirs. And then over here is. What in the world is going on here? I don't seem to understand the technology. Okay. You can see it plays. You're not even have to be on the website. So if you're a little bit worried about losing your creation after that 14 day trial, but you won't, but you also just want it as a separate file, you can do that. Let's wrap this up. So what we did tonight is we went back in, um, our friends at the Google Classroom, and we took a look at Google Sites. Google Sites is just like Classroom. Well, no, it's not just like Classroom. Google Sites is a much more full-featured uh, content creation site than the Classroom is. And to me, that is what you're using it for. You're using it as a way to put content that kids can access. Now, next week, when we take a look at some simulations that you can put into your Google Sites page that then run the simulation while the kid is sitting there looking at it, you don't have to leave the page to experience it. That is, to me, one of the arguments for the use of Google Sites. Um, it can be used as uh, we see here, it can be used as a way of sharing information with parents. I can't tell you how many uh, teachers, in fact, I have to, this is why I'm teaching at a school next Thursday, we'll have class. <laughs> we will have class. But I have to go to a school next Thursday because the original creator of the course uh, had students creating Weebly sites as their uh, websites as teachers. And when they came to me and said, what do you think about that? And I just yelled, no. Because as you probably know, Weebly is based upon Flash. Flash is going away. So why would I create something that's going to die? Google Sites is, would be the go-to for me. So we did that with Google Sites. We played around with it. I hope you saw how easy it is. And I hope you'll play with it. Um, you know, as I said, the, the rubric here is very straightforward. It's just you're going to create a site web page with a link that takes you back to your classroom and content for students to discover. When I was showing you how to do the link to the assignment and all of that, um, you know, icing on the cake. All you need to do is create the, the home page and then create the link that would take me back to your classroom from that home page and just find some content to put on there. It could be a YouTube channel. If you want to use that cool little URL uh, thing that'll take any URL and turn it into an embed, feel free. And then lastly, we looked at the digital native. Is it real? Um, do they truly exist? Or is it that we just have kids who have grown up with a ability to play with stuff and figure it out. Now that I think is worthy of a good research project. My colleague who lives next door to me here, uh, Stephen Tucker, he's actually done that with preschool kids. He's looked at preschool kids in terms of their ability to use technology. And what he found was, what do you think he found? Why do preschool kids come into preschool knowing how to handle books? Why do preschool kids come in knowing how to handle um, glue and crayons and paste and all of that? Because they've been exposed to it and they've used it before. It is not a mystery to me. I think what we need to do in schools is very early on, we need to realize that the thing be that a tablet, be that a Chromebook, the thing is not as important as what we're doing with the thing. And that's where we need to focus. We all can learn how to use the thing through creating. Because this generation is a very prosumer focus, they're used to making things with phones, uh, computers, tablets, that when we then work with them in a classroom, what we need to be saying to them is, let's go in, we're gonna create a Google Slides, you're gonna to explain to me your understanding of whatever it is I've been teaching you. You're gonna put that into your Google Drive. Um, if you want to work with a partner, da 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 da.
we have, I think, finally stepped into convergence, to true convergence, where the tools that 15, even 10 years ago, we were all kind of shaking our head and wonder about that we would have these in classrooms is now paper pencil. Okay, I'm done. You got any questions, Mark? Yes, Carrie, you got any questions, dear? No questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get together last week at Kisty. That's all right. We will have to try to get together. Where are you exactly, my friend? Uh, Brandenburg. Oh, that's not that far. Yeah, it's about an hour. Yeah, okay. We'll keep that conversation going. Those of you who have sent me your classrooms, uh, to look at, I, they're wonderful. They're great. Uh, I'm not going to worry about you, Miss Gupton, because what we filmed last week was your classroom. <laughs> okay. 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 So do I not need to put anything in the live text or anything? What you can do in the live text? Yeah. Uh, if you want, is uh, just put in there, uh, you know, the name of your classroom. And okay. for the purposes of the people who come in and look at our live text, although it's going away, um, what I'll do is I'll put, so I can get the link out of uh, Collaborate and I'll put that link in for you. Thank you so much. Okay. Now sites, you know, you can give me the sites link. Okay. That's not locked down. All right. Thank you all for being here. As always, I feel like I'm running a TV show. As always, if you have questions, comments, concerns, you can reach me at 502-457-2937. It's always a joy being with you. Thank you all. We're going to go in and do this right. We're going to go in and we're going to...